后接下来我们邀请 Andy 来分享如何用开源跟 Fedora 去达成他的要做的事情跟计划。你好，你好，你好。啊、uh, ，That's the only Chinese. No. So everywhere they go, people say 你好 and then at the end they say 谢谢 That's only end. Uh, uh, first I would like to thank uh, the Gods of Commit uh, members for accepting my talk and giving me the opportunity to present my talk over here. Uh, and apart from this, uh, there are two people that I really want to thank. Uh, one is my friend Sancho. Who actually told me about this conference and then I was able to fly. Uh, another one is my friend uh, Christy. Uh, she actually couldn't make it to Hong Kong, but she pushed me a lot to apply for the conference. Okay, so with that, um, um, and last thing, uh, the following points and uh, the talk is solely based uh, it's my personal opinion. And I'm not speaking on behalf of the exiled government, uh, exiled government, Tibetan government. Okay, so yeah, so something about myself. Uh, my name is Tenzin Chokhin. I have a uh, uh, four years in experience in security. So what I do in my day job is I do reverse engineering uh, and malware analysis. Uh, and the exiled Tibetan government, there's a small department called CCRC. It's the Tibetan Computer Resource Center. Uh, and I'm also the uh, NAL co-chapter lead of Jamsala. NAL is the India's biggest open security platform. And then last, uh, I've been a federal ambassador since uh, 2015, and I contribute to the federal security as uh, leader. Okay, so uh, in the audience, anybody uh, do you know about Ghostman? If they know, can you raise your hand? Ghostman, one, two, okay. So, Ghostman was uh, a massive cyber exploitation against the Tibetan community. So back in like, 2008, there were a lot of foreign diplomats that were cancelling their appointments with uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, that's the uh, political and the spiritual leader of Tibet. And these, and these constant uh, uh, cancelling would lead to a 10-month survey uh, done by Information Warfare Monitor, currently now, now known as the Citizen Lab, the University of Toronto. So this 10-month survey, extensive survey, led to uh, the finding that uh, the ghost net was uh, not only targeting the Tibetan community, but countries around, uh, like, more than 100 countries. And in that, uh, Taiwan is also included. So uh, Tibetan community and uh, Taiwanese, we are brothers in crime. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so ghost net, right? So this is the exiled Tibetan government. Uh, that's actually T means Tibet, like T building. That's the that's the new uh, exiled Tibetan government. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, so I was talking about uh, Tibetan Computer Resource Center, right? So Tibetan Computer Resource Center is an IT department, just like any IT department would. They would be in corporate or in government. Uh, so we look after the network, the hardware, uh, web and database. Uh, we have a lab for malware analysis section and then uh, data analysis. So, uh, yes. So the attack vector of GhostNet, right, was spread through social engineering. So how it happened was the high officials in the, the private office of His Holiness Dalai Lama, uh, their personal, uh, their emails would get compromised by sending them a copy of email, uh, urging them to open or review a document. So these personal uh, attachments are. are or links were copied in such a way that when you open and click on them, these would download uh, a crafted malware on the particular system, and upon and upon that would execute a remote execution, uh, remote access tool. So that uh, that can you know, you know control your whole system. It can record the keystroke, uh, your voice, uh, even um, um, turn on the camera, do every single uh, cyber espionage things. So. Um, yeah, and at the same time, it also does voice fingerprinting. That's what kind of operating system it's using, uh, uh, and according to the attack, it can a targeted uh, attack. Um, yeah. So this particular, uh, uh, I'm quoting this author from uh, from the report of Information Warfare Monitor. At uh, the fact that uh, they uh, attack, they particularly attacked attacked uh, the Tibetan uh, community was 
you know, it could be a state-sponsored Chinese government attack because a Chinese, um, a Ch an individual Chinese hacker may uh, attack uh, for economic reasons, but then targeting a political organization could possibly be uh, by the hands of Chinese government. Uh, so it still continues. So it was back in 2018 that the government was uh, uh, publicly uh, acknowledged. But then uh, I wanted to share two more recent examples. One is from Citizen Lab. So, <clears throat> so Citizen Lab recently did uh, from uh, notice a, a malware campaign from January to March 2018. So it's the same social engineering pattern about uh, developing NGO uh, receiving a PowerPoint file in which they would give uh, uh, like there would be a, um, a very uh, unlikely or corrupted message urging them to open a document. And once they do, it will uh, uh, it'll, it'll download a dropper on, on their particular system, which would connect to a CNC and then would wait for command and controls. So uh, this, but so uh, the PowerPoint file uh, that which was downloaded, it uh, belonged to a common vulnerability uh, CVE of 2017 of, of uh, Microsoft Rich Text Format and then RTF. So, Apart from this, when they uh, dig uh, deeper into it, this particular uh, malware campaign, right, it belonged to a bigger group called the Topic Trooper, which uh, is also known for, by the other name called Keyboy, and it also attacked uh, Taiwanese government and uh, Taiwanese uh, uh, companies. And they came to know about this particular uh, identification of malware to three particular malware signatures called uh, in Yaha. Yahoo, yeah, uh, Yaman, and then TSS and others. So, another recent uh, report is from the Red Alpha report. The campaign started in May 2017, and then the latest amount of surfaced in uh, August 2018. Uh, so, this also targets a lot of Tibetan communities in India, and then the method, the pattern is the same because uh, mm, social engineering uh, tools and tricks in such a way that you know people get fooled really easily. Because habits, people's habits never change, and without proper education, um, it's really, really difficult to avoid such attacks. Uh, so, like I said before, it does drop the custom malware, and then it communicates to uh, uh, a CNC server. And uh, upon uh, and upon uh, looking further into the malware uh, campaign, they find out that. that uh, this particular malware also targets uh, the larger group, they, which they mentioned as the five person, according to the, Ch the mainland Chinese government, which is the Tibetan independence movement, uh, the Uyghurs, the Taiwanese independence, uh, China's uh, China democracy, and then Falun Gong. So, so there are a few things that I want to you know uh, give uh, um, uh, heads up or advices, which is uh, basic security, right? So. A lack of technical resource and training leads many organizations to vulnerable to basic attacks. There are many NGOs, there are many uh, companies that, uh, without proper uh, uh, technical resource and then uh, uh, and training, would lead them even to basic, simple uh, social engineering attack, like me trying to uh, be Chi Hao and then you know, sending an email to other group to uh, open an email. And once you do that, you are vulnerable to uh, command and control attacks. Second is that, you know, uh, educate yourself and your peers. Uh, if your organizations or your uh, company is, uh, does receive a lot of, is uh, a part of such attacks or do receive such attacks, then it's really important for you and your peers to educate yourself about the attack and then being aware of your digital uh, fingerprinting. So, digital fingerprinting, what I mean is like your social media presence, you know, uh, uh, what kind of data you put out there in the internet. It's really important and then to know those platforms and then to what level that you can secure yourself. So these are the things that you should be uh, educating yourself and then your peers. Um, because uh, the private and sensitive information that you put out on the internet could be weaponized and used against you and your peers. Uh, and good digital hygiene and simple organization policies uh, to practice and keep checking. It's very, very important to have a, a good proper digital hygiene and then you keep you can keep practicing on that, and then to have and also uh, policies within your organizations, and then keep reviewing them uh, depending upon the time, like you know the months or like six months. 
and then keep checking if those policies are being uh, uh, are being working on. If they're not working, then what's going wrong? And you know, keep working on them. Uh, telegram. So uh, before coming here, uh, uh, being a federal ambassador, I, I wanted to meet the local uh, federal group over here, and then I was talking to the federal group uh, president, and then he was telling me about Telegram, which uh, I wanted to ask him: Is Telegram like the de facto uh, messaging app in Taiwan? Like, is it popular? No. No. Okay. So, but uh, okay. So the groups, the, the the people in the groups that I was talking to, they were using. A telegram a lot, and then my personal experience with telegram is that before coming to Taiwan, uh, uh, like although I'm in security, right? But then uh, my uh, sometimes you know uh, your habit can lead you to really uh, uh, problems. For example, my telegram was accessed from uh, from Hong Kong and mainland China uh, like twice because uh, although you know the the good thing about telegram is like. You can you can have multiple accounts on your on the web on the phone and on your home phones and then you can just provide a basic password. So I don't know how, but then somehow my password got hacked. And then the so if you check the logs of the Telegram, the I saw the um, IPs coming from Hong Kong and mainland China, and then I was like, uh, how is it even possible? So even for me, for my uh, I would say um, even though I work in security, but then my lack of uh, um, enabling the two-factor authentication or these basic simple simple things that you can, like I said before, that you can enable them to make sure that you are actually safe and to what to to what level of security that you want in uh, uh, in in the product that you use is really important. Uh, and the last thing is uh, when people talk about security, uh, the most common thing or the most common uh, word they use is "I have nothing to hide," which I think is a very uh, Dangerous thing because if you are working in a NGO or a company, uh, and then and then if you use this, uh, and, and if you believe in this model like I have nothing to hide, and then your information or and then you become the weak link in in that group of organizations which are being attacked by a state sponsor, and then you being a weak link, you your information can be used to attack a lot of other. Uh, organizations. So it's really, really important for uh, for every single individual, if they are being part of such targeted attacks, to be really uh, digitally aware of their social fingerprintings and then you know to educate to educate themselves. Uh, Fedora and Linux. So um, since most of the uh, malware is crafted uh, particularly for uh, Microsoft Office uh, documents, so. Linux can be used, for example, like LibreOffice to uh, open that particular uh, sample or a puppet or Word document if you think it's suspicious. And then, you know, uh, opening it in, into, uh, say, a sandbox uh, uh, container. Uh, using open source uh, software alternatives in, instead of, you know, um, excuse me, uh, for Microsoft to avoid such uh, attacks. Uh, challenges. So, so the challenge of uh, using Linux or open source in uh, many Tibetan settlements in India is because uh, of the location of rural uh, areas, number one. And second is the people uh, that are in those uh, settlement officers are, many people, they don't have uh, a huge, uh, uh, they are very literate in computer security and technology. So when it comes to introducing a whole new uh, open system to them, uh, troubleshooting and human resources is a very, very uh, difficult thing. And with that comes time and steep learning curve, which by the end of the day, uh, they, do, they, they do want to finish their job. And then learning another whole set of skill set is really uh, hard for them. Uh, and then dependencies comes in uh, the same, like uh, lack of resources, because Linux comes with uh, a lot of dependencies issues sometimes, and then in order to Result that you do need a certain amount of skill set and uh, training. Uh, priorities in uh, in various NGOs. So many uh, like some NGOs may or may not uh, consider uh, privacy as their uh, as the main goal. So according to that, they or they may or may not adopt uh, Linux. Uh, age and human nature. As people, um, I wouldn't say many, but then. 
most of the uh, few or most of the settlement officers they are quite in their mid thirties. So being that interesting, uh, like a uh, like a Linux over system is uh, quite hard, and and then with human nature, it's really uh, uh, difficult to learn a new skill set when you go on. So, okay. so open source projects, uh, Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is uh, like like everybody know is a uh, the multi label free content free edit website based. Right? So why I'm mentioning Wikipedia is that when you when you type Tibet in Wikipedia, so when you type Tibet in Google, uh, you will see links from Wikipedia. But for people who know about Tibet is another thing. But then for people who don't know anything about Tibet, uh, they will go to Wikipedia and they look at the uh, uh, the history of that. So uh, and this is the. Uh, Wikipedia page, uh, if you look for the this all on this. Uh, so back in early 2011, uh, uh, Tibetan people have noticed uh, that the contents of the Tibetan history in, in, in Wikipedia was being changed and altered, and it was not equivalent to what Tibetans believed to be the Tibetan history, and it was more of a, like uh, the mainland Chinese version of it. So, uh, so as I said, uh, people without the background of Tibetan history would have the false notion of you know what what the Tibetans and Tibetan origin and history are. So uh, according to that, there were con uh, workshops conducted on, you know, on Wikipedia usage and then uh, performing edits. Uh, so uh, I did the same talk in 2015, uh, back in, uh, in Pune. And then, uh, so when I typed Tibet back then, uh, I couldn't find Tibet. And like, uh, if, I, if I zoomed further and further, uh, like, I would find it at some point. But then this is uh, when you look at the surface level. So this is yesterday. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe Google changed it after looking at my talk. I don't know. But then, <laughs> so this is this is yesterday when I typed uh, Tibet, and then they actually uh, it's all it should be over there. So this is a this is a report done by uh, uh, by InfoSec Institute, and then you see that the yellow part is only Tibet. So okay, um, why I'm mentioning Wikipedia is because. Uh, Tibet is comprised of three regions, so to to make some right, without which uh, each, uh, so um, giving uh, only this yellow part means we are losing a huge part of uh, of the com part. So uh, Wikipedia does allow uh, being an open source and editing. It does allow you to uh, give the uh, the proper picture of the Tibetan history. Uh, localization. Uh, so localization is is. Uh, in terms of Fedora, it's, it's important because uh, it's important because of the Tibetan language and culture, uh, and then we are free and uh, allowed to do so in the uh, exiled Tibetan in, in, in India. But then in Tibet, such which uh, such thing would be a huge risk in for the teacher and, and the students. Uh, so this quote is from that same uh, uh, same report of uh, the, the ghost hunt, where it says that you know uh, performing such. Uh, uh, language uh, and then uh, would be uh, a huge risk even for the life of the Tibetan, uh, the teacher and the student in Tibet. Um, okay, so the idea of the local additions of the Tibetan language into Fedora was so that the teachers and the students would not have to risk their lives, and then the Fedora of the whole, the whole uh, uh, complete localized open system replacing the role of teacher in, uh, in Tibet. Uh, so now chapter. So uh, so null now is like I said, it's a, one of the biggest India's uh, open source security platform. Uh, so there are currently there are like twelve chapters in India, uh, and then uh, two, one in Singapore, one in Amsterdam. So uh, so now there is a chapter which I am the co-chapter lead. Started in July two thousand fourteen, and then it the last we we have done in two thousand and sixteen. So uh, what went wrong? I mean, like, so from two thousand sixteen to two thousand eighteen, they haven't been we haven't done any. Uh, now meets and it's because introduction to security. So when now was started in terms of there were a lot of people enthusiastic about it, and then we have so many speakers, so many, uh, so many speakers and audiences to talk about. But as time goes on, uh, uh, speakers like myself and others we ran out of uh, topics, and then the, the audience were always the same, and uh, and then there. Uh, there was a huge skill set gap between the, the speaker and then the audience, and then the audience wanting something really basic, and the speakers having. Uh, okay. And then uh, beginner users and skills. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
many of the audience uh, were were beginner users and with beginner skills, and they don't want to learn uh, like malware analysis or network traffic analysis. They just want to know how to uh, um, how to use basic Linux or basic troubleshooting, and then uh, and changing you. Um, okay. How much time? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll just uh, skip this then. Um, so um, with null, the lessons that I learned was um, maybe in how many uh, uh, there's the direct group. There's uh, there are many open source groups, but then the lessons that I want to share about uh, what uh, of how of, of why we failed with the null community was because uh, the core members of who started the uh, 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 of who started the open source community should always think about the big picture, right? They should think about think about the long run and keep going. There will be times that where there will be uh, only the core members and there will not be any new uh, new members, but that's okay because uh, you should keep going and learn to teach for curious choice. So curious choice is a reference that I'm making because uh, in in your um, open source community when there will be meetings or meetups. There will be one or two people who, who always will ask, uh, who always come to you for more and more and um, uh, for more questions and then for something that you don't even know. And then for that, you have to uh, take responsibility and learn that particular topic that uh, he or uh, for that person, and then take charge and then uh, lead. And then uh, lead, inspire, and pass the torch. Uh, lead in terms of you know uh, keep going and then inspire those who want to uh, become a, become the part of the community and then pass the torch, like, you know, because like everything else, it's impermanent. So at some point you have to pass the torch to the younger generation. So when but, so when you see somebody like that in that uh, in your community, uh, you know, notice that talent, notice that person, and then you know, you're ready to pass the torch. So um, physical place made of, and made of stress. So one of the things that we stress a lot was uh, for a for a physical place, uh, for all of the participants and then the core members to meet up every time, and then uh, we have realized that you know, uh, online was also an alternative options which we we never considered like Slack and IRC. So uh, basics, you know, since uh, one of our main concerns was when when starting the North chapter group was our focus was on security, but then I always believe that if I always um, uh, keep listening to the basic trivial questions, I would, the whole focus from the security will be diverted. But then the question is, is like, um, like I said, keep going. It has to start from somewhere. So somewhere as in like, you know, uh, for example, security can be taught in so many other ways. For example, your mobile usage, email, web, and privacy. Uh, so, yeah, and last, thing is documentation. I'm using a Buddhist reference over here because uh, when there were so many uh, beginner users uh, in, uh, when there were so many beginner users in, uh, in, uh, in the null chapter group, there were certain questions and certain topics that had to be repeated every single time. And it was really, really time consuming and we never really uh, took the time to document them. And I'm stressing on documentation because uh, opens, uh, so when you are having a community, and when there will be uh, people of different different uh, uh, disciplines, it's really important for you to document uh, topics that have been taught already or problems that have been already tackled to document those. So when such a uh, new audience will come, you don't have to uh, waste a lot of time to uh, teach them again and again. Uh, so hacker high school. So this is something that I uh, that 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 I'm really really uh, open and would want to do. In my community, so it's an open source initiative by Axicom. Uh, so uh, it's a collection of lessons of uh, how to be secure online and how to be a hacker. Hacker meaning like uh, to uh, to break into things and then to learn things uh, to become a better student and a better people. So the the person on the right is the Yoke Simon. So uh, he's the one that introduced me to the Drupal community uh, and uh, and mentored me to become an ambassador. Um, so what's really good about Hacker High School is it's a very well documented with lesson planning. So anybody who wants to uh, dive into security uh, uh, can always reference this. 
uh, and security ferry options for students. So back then when I was in school, the only uh, career opportunity for computer science was to be uh, for uh, like coding and software. There was never mentioning about security. So with this uh, uh, lesson planning and book, I think it just you know in a, uh, opens up a lot of opportunities for kids. Uh, so pros with open open source. I think I'm I close to the end now. So uh, the what are the pros of uh, using an open source? Number one is community. So uh, a lot of uh, so with uh, with community, what I mean is people from multidisciplinary work like working towards the same goal. Uh, I think the one good example is the Gov Summit of uh, the community. Uh, they are uh, a lot of people from many, many disciplines from technical, non-technical background, but then they're working towards, um, also volunteers, they're working towards the same goal. Uh, second is transparency. Uh, so transparency in terms of open methods, open auditing, uh, open source, uh, which is being reviewed by many other uh, disciplines. And then people can always build on, on, on what they have agreed. Uh, collaboration. So based on what they've agreed, they can always build on it. Um, change. So a good thing about the open source uh, product is if you don't like something in that, whether it be uh, uh, a, fe uh, uh, a product feature or a design, you can always work on it, and then you can always uh, be uh, you can always change it, and then can be contributed back towards the community. Uh, communication. Uh, so communication is really important because what we have learned, uh, what I've learned specifically, uh, coming from a security background, when you talk to a non-technical people, uh, uh, teaching about the basic of security, it's really, really difficult, most difficult for me. So open source uh, community allowed me to be more uh, uh, down to earth and be more simple in terms of communicating. And licensing, alas, is, uh, so licensing is really important. There are good and bad licenses in, in open source. So. Um, so I would like to end my talk with two, uh, two, two quotes. Uh, one is, uh, so uh, this is this is saying in Tibetan like a tragedy should should be utilized as a source of strength, no matter the difficulties, how it's, how painful the experience is. So if we lose our hope, that's a real disaster. So as you know, Tibetans and Taiwanese communities, I think we should never lose our hope and then you know keep fighting for what we believe uh, is right. And then the last one is. Uh, so, so everybody in this room, right, I think uh, can play a very important and vital role in contributing. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so, so everybody in this room uh, can be uh, a very important, uh, can play a very important role in contributing back to it, the community. So I will, if you think that you're too small to make a, uh, to make a difference, so try speaking with Ms. Gita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.